Hi, everybody. Uh, let's get started. Uh, who knew that sleep was such a hot topic uh, at Google? I'm Peter Allen, director of Google University, and delighted to welcome the world's leading authority on sleep, sleep disorders, and the dangers of sleep deprivation, William DeMent, MD, PhD, chief of the newly created Division of Sleep at Stanford University's School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. DeMent holds a BA from the University of Washington, uh, an MD and PhD in neuropsychology, neurophysiology from the University of Chicago, uh, was essentially the person who discovered rapid eye movement or REM sleep, so he has been an authority in this field for a long time, founder of the American Academy of Sleep Medicine and 12 years, for 12 years its president, uh, was chairman of the US Congress's National Commission on Sleep Disorders Research, uh, 2001 received the largest NIH research grant in sleep medicine history for work on sleep apnea, is the author or co-author of over 500 scientific publications, including textbooks The Sleep Watchers and The Promise of Sleep. He's also the uh, professor of what I understand is the most popular course at Stanford, a uh, course on sleep. I've noted that Stanford uh, focuses on sleep. Harvard's most popular course is a course on happiness. Wharton's most popular course is a course on negotiation, and I don't know what that tells us, um, but certainly this is one of the most popular lectures we've sponsored recently. Dr. DeMent uh, will be talking about essentially healthy sleep and something that we care a lot about, optimal performance, uh, noting that healthy sleep is by far the most powerful determinant of high-level performance and productivity. Three major characteristics are a sufficient amount and continuity of sleep, and I can hear you all thinking, all right, do I get enough sleep? Probably not. Is it continuous? Maybe not. Absence or near absence of pathological sleep-related events, and reasonable synchronizing of desired time in bed with circadian rhythm. So if you're a napper, then you need to be paying attention to that. So without uh, further ado, thank you, Dr. DeMent. We're excited to have you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm going to start off uh, with a video clip. Show the clip, magically. Oh. <laughs> I thought it just made it. This is what shouldn't happen uh, when you're driving. But this is a live. man survived, fortunately, but as a matter of fact, um, when an accident occurs, now we can go on magically with the rest. Uh, if an accident occurs while you're driving, the chances that someone will die are about 80%. So if you feel your eyelids getting heavy, uh, pull off the road. Drowsiness is red alert. Is there anybody in the audience who's heard me say that before? Anybody here from, from Stanford? Anybody take sleep and dreams? One person? OK. Everybody else stayed away. <clears throat> anyway, I think you're happy enough, uh, actually. Google is, you know, has a reputation of being the, the happiest workplace on the planet. I am not at my best today. Did I already say that? I am coming off a fairly severe cold, but I don't think I'm contagious. So, <clears throat> the triumvirate of health for, you know, if you don't have cancer or something, but is, is new, and you do it here, nutrition, physical fitness. Now, hopefully, you'll add normal, healthy sleep. And I'm sure that, for the most part, your sleep is healthy, but you need to know a little bit more about it. Now, uh, I, I think that, for many people, sleep is like a drive, you know, a hunger drive, a thirst drive. And here we see sleep and hunger competing. <laughs> and we'll see, we'll see which drive wins out, finally. <laughs> mm. 
No. Sleep, sleep one, finally. <clears throat> he was carried off to bed. That's my grandson, my middle grandson, who's, who's this tall now. So uh, we were saying, though, for, for productivity, you know, you, for healthy young adults, I would say certainly getting enough sleep is, is the most important thing. On a day, day-to-day basis, uh, f- obviously if you're totally unfit or your nutrition is extremely poor, that would affect productivity. But in a sort of day-to-day scheme of things, uh, normal, adequate sleep fosters high productivity. Now, that means, and we'll go through this, you have a low sleep debt. I don't know how many of you know, know about sleep debt. No pathological events. That would be like your breathing stops when you fall asleep. And that your biological clock, which alerts the brain for long periods of time during certain parts of the day, that, that that alerting pretty much coincides with your waking hours. Uh, so we're, we're going to go over the nature of sleep. I don't think I'll talk very much about dreaming, but dreaming uh, occurs during rapid eye movement sleep and all during rapid eye movement sleep. And the, the concept of sleep debt, <clears throat> why you can't fall asleep sometimes at, when you want to go to bed early, why some people feel tired all the time and don't know why. I mean, I, I've heard that, I like to say, thousands of times. I'm tired all the time and I don't know why. Well, for healthy young adults, there's only one cause, and, and that is sleep debt. Uh, and then I've already said drowsiness is red alert. Uh, so my uh, path through my career, I started by chance, went to the University of Chicago, where the only man on the planet who was studying sleep was in the Department of Physiology. Then I was recruited to, to uh, actually went to New York for a few years, but I was recruited to Stanford, and, and in a dormitory, in the Wilbur Hall complex, set up, set up a sleep laboratory. I gave my first lectures on sleep at Stanford from the, in the Memorial Church, and I felt blasphemous. I remember I, I uh, <clears throat> anyway, this is my mentor at the University of Chicago. This is from Life magazine in 1959 when the pub, public, first public article on the sleep, all night sleep cycle was published. It has a Freudian uh, bent, but remember that's back in the 50s. This is the Cedro House in Wilbur Hall. We actually had a wedding in the dormitory. Uh, it turns out it was a fake wedding, but the the uh, provost happened to be a guest that night, and he was really, really worried that I hadn't gotten consent of the parents for these two kids to get married. Uh, the young woman on the, your left is now just retiring from the board of trustees at Stanford, Joy Simmons. And there they are <clears throat> eating their wedding cake. And, so, and then we had, this is our sleep laboratory in Wilbur Hall in the basement. Those basement rooms are gone. I don't know what the hell they did. They filled them in with concrete or something. Uh, and here are some students back then. The students don't exactly dress that way anymore. <laughs> um, and this is, of course, you rec- those of you who went to Stanford, or that, that one person <laughs> will recognize this, that, as a memorial church. This is me giving uh, my lecture from the pulpit. As I say, I felt so uncomfortable there that I only did it once. Then I went down the steps. Then uh, <clears throat> we finally knew enough about sleep disorders to offer a continuing medical education course. So I say, in a way, that was the birthday of sleep medicine. Uh, with narcolepsy, sleep apnea, insomnia, disorders, etc. So, what is sleep? Now, how many, would people who think they know exactly what sleep is, raise their hand. So, what, what does that mean? She went like this. <laughs> it means I read your sleep watch. Ah, okay. No, it's a, it could be very precisely defined. <clears throat> and it, at the moment, of, sleep is a period of sensory isolation. In other words, at the moment of sleep, the sensory input from the environment is, is blocked from your consciousness. You can sort of, you can be awakened, but you know, if someone were whispering your name, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hear it unless you woke up. And so here is the moment of sleep. On the left is alpha rhythm of wakefulness, and at that, 
at the arrow, that would be the point at which you suddenly wouldn't hear anything, wouldn't see anything. If your eyelids were taped open, you wouldn't see anything. Now, this is a wonderful experiment. I uh, it was conceived by Christian Gilmano, uh, whose long name appears there. But that's a 50,000 lux strobe light that flashes about every 10 seconds at random. The brain waves are being recorded, and the subject is, when the light flashes, which is like the gurney wiggles, it's so bright, he's supposed to press a micro switch. And this, this is how we learned this uh, shutdown of sensory input, is that he'd be pushing, and then the light would flash, and nothing happened. He'd say, why don't you, remember, his eyelids are taped open, so we he said, why didn't you push the micro switch? Well, the light didn't flash. Well, everybody in the room saw it flash, so that, that is, in fact, the moment of sleep. And here's an example uh, where you see the, the stimulus, and at this point, there's a little micro sleep, and the subject doesn't see the light flash. So that, that's what sleep is. Now, it's, in, in experimental animals, it's been shown that the transmission of sensory input, all your sensory input goes through a structure called the thalamus in the brain, and it's, it apparently is blocked at that level because you can see the, what's called the postsynaptic potential in this example disappears when sleep actually occurs. So every one of us has two entirely different kinds of sleep. You probably know this. REM sleep or dreaming sleep and non-REM sleep. REM sleep is interesting uh, <clears throat> in that you're completely paralyzed. Now, to show <laughs> this, was a, this was a test, uh, we have not penetrated the educational system. You know, it's sort of like sleep came along after we had reached a limit of curriculum time and everything else. Uh, in fact, I went through a big battle at Stanford Medical School trying to get a little bit of education about sleep disorders. We finally got one hour out of whatever it is, 400. Anyway, in, in uh, 2005, I sent some teaching assistants into San Francisco to just stop people and say, do you know what REM stands for? And n not a single person answered rapid eye movement sleep. And, and uh, no, they were all familiar with R.E.M. the band, which, by the way, played a concert uh, last summer, which we attended. <laughs> and I couldn't, I wanted to go backstage and have them sign my book, but they wouldn't let me go backstage. I almost got arrested. Um, so here they are, the, the young R.E.M. and the more, more mature R.E.M. And then, of course, this has been applied to other things, toys, liquor. Now, these are the rapid eye movements, and I show this. This was a monkey who slept with his eyelids half open. It's just a, humans, human rapid eye movements are exactly the same, binocularly synchronous, and you do this two hours every single night, looking at, we assume, I mean, a simple way to say it is you're looking at the dream. So you say, what is this monkey dreaming about? Bananas everywhere. <laughs> And I said, during REM sleep, the body is completely paralyzed. And there's an illness called narcolepsy in which the victims have attacks of REM sleep. And the manifestation is to become paralyzed. And this is a narcoleptic patient. And the excitement actually brings these attack, precipitates the attacks. So he was playing baseball, and he got a little excited and then became completely paralyzed. Uh, we have discovered this in dogs, and in fact, <clears throat> we were able to develop a heritable colony. This was the very first narcoleptic dog. That we, she couldn't, we thought she'd starve to death because every time she'd approach, the, the joy of eating would precipitate these attacks in the dogs. Uh, I like to tell a story that <clears throat> I've been very uh, politically active, uh, you know, advocating more education about sleep disorder and so on. But um, this first dog that couldn't eat in the bowl was uh, 
we had shown a movie of a human being having a cataplectic attack, and someone said, well, I know a person who has a dog that does that. And it was in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, and I, uh, the owners were willing to let me have the dog and have it shipped to Stanford. But uh, it would have had to have been back then Western Airlines, and the, the, uh, whoever I was dealing with said, no sick dogs on airplanes. And I said, well, no, 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 the dog has narcolepsy. It's not contagious. It's just, no sick dogs on airplanes. And I just couldn't get by this idiot. So I'm thinking, God, we won't be able to. And then this light bulb went off. Call your congressman. And I did. His name was Pete McCloskey back then. By the way, he ran against Richard Nixon in the Republican primary in New Hampshire. That's how far back I go. Uh, and by George, 50 minutes later, my phone rang. This is the president of Western Airlines. I'd like to help you in any way I can. <laughs> uh, so I said, con congressional people have a little bit of clout. Uh, so the dog was shipped to Stanford, and, and uh, we finally were able to get a a full colony and then develop hereditary uh, a trait of narcolepsy. Now, th this just shows the reason you're paralyzed is these are uh, inhibitory neurons in the spinal cord get activated all at the same time in this illness. And then it just paralyzed. Alpha motor neurons are inhibited, and that, that means you are, in fact, paralyzed. <clears throat> and this is just to make the point uh, that we have actually cloned the narcolepsy gene in dogs. It was done by my colleague, Emmanuel Mignot. <clears throat> it, it, it coded for a receptor in the brain that was defective that has to do with alerting. And then, lo and behold, the same compound is absent in the spinal fluid of human narcoleptics. So fairly quickly, we learned what the cause is in the cells. <clears throat> that utilize this compound as a neurotransmitter are absent in the brain of these patients. And that's, we don't actually, uh, it's brain bank material that you look at. Although some narcoleptics have volunteered their brains. You know, say, the first time that ever happened, one of my, uh, I guess, offices says, well, where are we going to put the brain? Oh, I said, just put it in the file cabinet. <laughs> but we, they're actually brain bank uh, materials. And, uh, liquid nitrogen, et cetera. This is what all night sleep looks like. This is your sleep. Uh, the blue horizontal bars are the periods of REM sleep. REM sleep never occurs, usually doesn't occur first. Uh, and the REM periods get longer the later in the night they appear. So in the first six hours of your sleep, you have about 100 minutes in the dream world. Now, I like to say the dream world is as real as the real world. That is a sensory apparatus is fully functioning. The, the only difference is you're looking at the dream world through the frosted glass of memory. Your memory of, of the dream is, is not like, well, actually, memory of, of your waking activities isn't all that great, but it's better than memory of the dream activity, certainly. Now, what you must understand, and is Googlers the right term? I wasn't, I wasn't too sure about that. Uh, sleep dead is maybe the most important, and I'll go into that first. And it's all lost sleep accumulates as a debt. And uh, we measure or infer the size of the sleep debt by the speed with which you can fall asleep. So if, if someone were just to come up here, lie down on the floor, and fall asleep immediately, we'd know that they had a pretty big sleep debt. If it took 20 minutes, or it didn't occur. I mean, I suppose being in front of an audience would have a, make you a little inhibited about falling asleep. But, but the speed of falling asleep is a, is a very good uh, indicator of the size of the sleep debt. And there is a standard protocol that we use to measure this. And you, you have four tests of the speed of falling asleep in a quiet, dark uh, place, and this would be, then you can plot this, what we call the multiple sleep latency test profile. Now, these are not naps. The test is over when you fall asleep. So almost at the moment of sleep, the test is terminated. You get out of bed, do it again two hours later. And this is, this is a very alert person, believe it or not. Even though they can fall asleep 
uh, every time during the day because if, if you really have a big sleep that your sleep latencies will be down here falling asleep in a minute. And, and it's related to total sleep time. This is a study done some years ago that the, obviously the less you sleep at night, the, fat, the more sleepy you are in the daytime. <clears throat> and this, this was a study uh, for the one person who went to Stanford in the Lambda Nu. The Lambda Nu fraternity house was converted into a summer sleep laboratory. It is now the Jerry Garcia house. And it went through several name changes, I understand. As, as rock stars came and went. Uh, but we, we restricted sleep to five hours a night and then measured the speed of falling asleep in the day and showed, whoops, showed for the first time that sleep loss was cumulative. So they're losing essentially three hours of sleep a night and getting progressively more sleepy in the daytime. And if you go long enough, this is only seven nights, you sort of would bottom out and be completely unable to stay awake in the daytime almost no matter what. Although you can keep people awake for very long periods of time by pushing them around or poking them or whatever. Uh, <clears throat> the world record for staying awake in a monitored situation is 11 days. That record is held by a uh, now 50, almost 60, let's see, 64, He's uh, 60 years old, a high school student, stayed awake for 11 days in 1964. We were monitoring him. Uh, no one has done it longer since that time. Not that there's any reason anyone would. And he, he uh, visited uh, a few years ago and was asked, this was for a television program called Inside Edition, which you'll see some examples of later, would you do this again? No way would I ever do this again. So he was miserable, but he had a goal. And uh, at the end, there was a press conference. That was before TV or, or cable. So about 300 media people were standing in front of his house. He came out on the porch and gave his final interview before going to bed. And they said, How'd you, his name was Randy Gardner. How'd you do it, Randy? How'd you do it, Randy? Oh, it's just mind over matter. And then he went to bed. <laughs> so there's, there's wisdom in there somewhere. So sleep debt is, is uh, defined here. The cumulative daily hours of sleep less than the mean daily amount needed. Most people don't know how much sleep they need. Uh, exactly. I mean, you know, I, I need, if I don't get at least five hours, I, I can't function. But it can accumulate like 15 minutes a day until you get, you're tired and you don't sort of know why. And it can only be reduced by getting extra sleep. <clears throat> so this is a diagram. <laughs> a woman actually drew this on a napkin for me and just did it. And I thought, that's just so wonderful. Uh, but this is what happens. It gets bigger and bigger until you crash. <laughs> now, uh, here is, we did this. Uh, for Inside Edition, uh, which was a television program, the star of the show came out to Stanford and was going to stay awake for three days. And Do she you have had one of yours, Lou? in this uh, oh, please read it. episode a crying <clears throat> gag like my, for no reason my at all. My favorite Dr. Seuss, except for the 500 hats of our colony yes. cubbins. <laughs> It's just like overwhelming. I'm just really tired. So one of the effects of losing sleep know, is it's emotional it's... upset. In this case, this uh, she know, cried for about it's ten it's minutes really for no reason and couldn't stop. But I won't. I think interesting as it is, it gets a little boring after five or ten minutes. So I'm going to go on to. The next one is a laughing jag. <laughs> I think. I just feel like this is just too weird, but it there's like this natural high or something, don't you feel? <laughs> Everything is hysterical, just so you know. 
<laughs> that is so true. Um, but doesn't it doesn't it feel like I don't know? I just it feels like I've taken some kind of um, I don't know pill or something that's made me pill. and I'm I'm very I'm unbalanced on my feet. Yeah, or like alcohol, some sort of drug. Yeah, I don't know. It's like you don't even need alcohol. You just stay up for three nights and you're fine. <laughs> Forever. And ever. I never ends. And I, it's, it's so bad I can't untie this knot right here. <laughs> How long have you been trying? I have been trying for about two hours, and I can't get it done done. Two hours. So I don't understand. So you work you work for the sleep doctor. Why does why does this happen? I don't understand. Why am I getting punched? Oh, sure. Put it on me. Just like work for the sleep doctor. But why um. <laughs> Why? I don't understand. Or is this just part of the, like, being punchy or something from not not, not enough sleep? Do you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, dude. You found that it's much easier to form sentences when your eyes are closed. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it doesn't look like the silverware gets a lot cleaner, too. <laughs> when your eyes are closed? <laughs> anyway. They kept laughing for about another 10 minutes. And interesting as that is, it probably will get a little boring if I let it go on. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's really dirty. The young man who was uh, undergoing this also was a, an assistant of mine. He's now a, a veterinarian in Los Angeles. Uh, so... You can go in the opposite direction, and uh, Sherry Ma, who's with me today, my, <clears throat> my assistant who passed out the questionnaire, has been extending sleep, and what that means is most people care, are carrying a sleep debt so you can get extra sleep. If you have no sleep debt, you can only sleep your daily requirements. So uh, what we have here is this sleep latency measure that I, I illustrated. Whoops. And this is kind of normal uh, alertness, but with the 10 hours in bed for a few nights, the, the mobile sleep latency test goes up so that either you can't fall asleep, the test is only allowed to go on for 20 minutes, otherwise you'd be lying in bed all day long. Uh, and it, if you don't fall asleep in 20 minutes, you get out of bed, but that means you're very, very alert. And so after sleep extension, we... we uh, approach the 20-minute 20, 20 limit with many people. And uh, this was a study done by uh, <clears throat> the Army, actually. Uh, and they took what they thought were completely normal young adults and uh, had baseline sleep uh, eight hours in bed. And then they put them to bed for 14 hours every single night for five weeks. You had to stay in bed in the dark. And I don't think there are anybody in this room who's d ever done anything like that. But it's, it's incredibly boring, and there's nothing to do but sleep. So what they found was uh, the sleep time went up very, to a very high level, almost to the entire 14 hours. But then as the sleep debt was paid back, this, this came down to a, uh, an equilibrium and it, and it turned out to be 8 hours and 15 minutes, which you might say that's the normal sleep quota for this group. But, it, but I, always, I was always asking the experimenter, because it wasn't me, what, how did they tolerate lying awake in bed in the dark with nothing to do for 5 hours and 45 minutes every night for the last three weeks? Well, they were paid, and they were in the military, so they were ordered to stay in bed. <laughs> And this is just one of the subjects. The, the other thing, though, that was very important was that after this sleep, you can think of the area under this uh, curve here as the sleep debt. When it was paid back, uh, even though it was boring, they, the, you felt great. You felt full of energy. You felt at the peak of your mental powers. And that, that has been confirmed several times since, so that uh, in the studies that are being done now by Sherry Ma, this is uh, studying athletic performance, 
And the major goal is to reduce the sleep debt to zero by sleep extension, and that's spending more time in bed. And then the measurements are reaction time, energy, fatigue, athletic performance. So here's basketball. And you can see that the sprint time is reduced significantly by obtaining extra sleep. And the, I think uh, the players are kind of amazed by this because they, they assume this is my personal best. I couldn't possibly do better. And then they do better. Uh, here are three-point shots. Uh, that improves. In this, in this case, uh, free throw percentage improves. And then fatigue ratings go practically this way down. You know, whatever. When someone says, I'm fatigued, sometimes you kind of wonder, what do they really mean? You know, I feel tired. I don't have motivation. I'd rather just sit. Uh, that's kind of the way I feel right now. But um, it is, it's a virus in my case. <clears throat> Uh, here are the group changes in these energy and fatigue ratings. So energy, the feeling of being energetic goes way up, and the feeling of fatigue goes way down. Performance, improved weight training and conditioning, increased focus and concentration on court, faster recovery from fatigue, potential decrease in injuries, decrease, as I've already said, in fatigue ratings and increase in energy ratings and improved performance. I mean, that's, that's really worth getting a little extra sleep. And I think uh, we expect Stanford to win a lot of championships uh, by getting a, sleeping more. Uh, the, the thing is that they also say, well, the professors have to stop making us write papers. <laughs> so I said, I, I don't have that much control over the faculty. Whoops. So the, the lesson is you sleep debt is the culprit for healthy young adults not being at their peak. And just remember, you can pay it back until you're wide awake, alert, and energetic all day long. And I see some people who don't look that energetic. <laughs> I'm not, I haven't seen anyone fall asleep, though. I see someone yawning. <laughs> yawn, yes, it was a fine yawn, and you have a gold filling in your left molar there. That's <laughs> <clears throat> so these are the kinds of things that people say. Uh, for the first time in my Stanford career, I don't need an alarm to wake me up. I'm never drowsy in my biology section. Uh, I am less cranky. Sleep-deprived people tend to be cranky and irritable. <coughs> Studying is better. So just remember, if, you're health, if you don't have a virus or an illness, it's, it's sleep debt. So can sleepy students learn anything? And I, I think learning is very impaired. Uh, here's <laughs> <laughs> Army troops, listen to a speech by President Bush. Okay. Now, he's not very, that exciting as a speaker, frankly. I... Now, another thing you need to know about is what's called clock-dependent alerting. There's a biological clock, which is a cluster of neurons at the base of the brain and alerts the brain for long periods of time, usually at the same time every day. And you need to know what that period is. And it is the main <clears throat> contributor for young adults being unable to fall asleep at an early bedtime. So if you, if you could measure alertness, you'll see usually for young adults, it's hard to get up in the morning. And you kind of struggle through the morning. And then sometime in the afternoon, you start to feel more alert. And most, and certainly it's uh, uh, undergraduates at Stanford, by far, uh, close to 90% say my best time is in the evening. And then I have a little trouble you know, falling asleep at 2 AM. The actual mean bedtime for Stanford undergraduates is 2.30. And some can't fall asleep till 4. But that's because this clock-dependent alerting keeps them awake. 
Uh, and it's far the most uh, common cause of insomnia. So, so a student says, well, I went to bed at 11. I couldn't fall asleep until 2. That's normal. The only way you can fall asleep at 11, you have to take your whole biological rhythm and set it earlier. And it can be reset uh, by bright light. But when, it's, when someone, is, say, goes from being a student where it doesn't matter so much when you get up, although I was shocked and horrified, my grandson just told me he had an 8 o'clock class. And I thought I had succeeded in eliminating all 8 o'clock classes at Stanford. Uh, and I, I really did. I mean, I made, made the effort. Uh, at any rate, when it's persistent and you can't deal with it by imposing a schedule for a long period of time, it's called delayed sleep phase syndrome. And it's normal in students, but if, if, it's, if you're now supposed to be at work at 8 o'clock in the morning and, and be wide awake and alert, uh, it's a problem. So <clears throat> we uh, sort of discovered this, and it was in the uh, Lambda Nu fraternity house that these studies were done, but we put students on a 90-minute day where they had to go to bed every 90 minutes for 30 minutes. And the, th the idea would be, well, if you immediately fell asleep and you slept for the whole 30 minutes, in a 24-hour day, you'd accumulate eight hours of sleep. But nobody could do that. This is actually what happened. And these are five consecutive days. There are periods of time, and this is inside. You, you, know, you didn't know what time it was. Uh, there were periods of time when even though they were getting tremendously sleep deprived, they couldn't sleep at all. Like, so sleep, whoops. The, the sleep latency is a full 30 minutes, then you have to get out of bed. And, and so this is the, the reason. And there's a, now, I always like to say, and I'm going to see what happens, that the biological clock in your head doesn't look like that. <laughs> see, they chuckled. Uh, no, anyway, uh, I was um, talking to a group, it'd be kind of like this group, and I said that, and the, <clears throat> the previous time I used it, there was a huge belly laugh, and then in this time, there was just silence. And I said, oh, that's funny, and when I, when I said the clock doesn't look like that, I got a big laugh, and then finally a voice shouts out, we're digital. <laughs> well, <laughs> now... This is a brain slice preparation from a ground squirrel, but this is the bio two little tiny bilateral nuclei in the brain at the base of the brain are where the biological clock is housed. It's called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. And that has this incredible control over every function in the body. Now, if the clock is destroyed, this happens to be squirrel monkeys, this is the daily temperature rhythm, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven days here. These are the sleep stages. The monkey is in complete constant conditions, just in a white box with food and water ad lib, and goes to sleep once every 24 hours and sleeps for, in the case of the monkey, about nine hours, and then wakes up and stays awake for 15 hours. When the biological clock is eliminated, then there's no longer this prolonged period, prolonged period of wakefulness. It just falls asleep, wakes up, falls asleep, wakes up, falls asleep. And the temperature rhythm is also gone. So uh, it's easy, even if you don't have a clock, you can prod the monkey or the rat or whatever it is, and they can certainly be kept awake. Now, do we have, are we the same? And the best evidence goes back to this multiple sleep latency test that I already mentioned. Uh, and what you see if you do this continuously is the typical subject, usually an undergraduate, will be very sleepy, falling asleep here in less than five minutes in a strange situation. Then suddenly, with no sleep, remember, the test is terminated the instant the subject falls asleep. With no sleep, we saw this amazing alertness recovery. And the first time this happened, I just couldn't believe it, because I didn't know about clock-dependent alerting. But this has then been studied over and over and over. And in general, there's this uh, alertness recovers in the evening without sleep. And that's, that's from the biological clock. 
Then it turns off later, and you can, you're left alone with your sleep debt. You go to sleep almost immediately. So this is the definition of clock-dependent alerting. <clears throat> And here are uh, students at 4 in the afternoon. And if you don't do something, they fall asleep. But in the evening, they're wide awake. <laughs> Party time. <laughs> so the alert brain. Uh, so these are uh, commonplace mythologies. A big lunch makes me drowsy. If you don't have a sleep debt, you don't get drowsy. It's possible to get too much sleep. Not true. There's no such thing as too much sleep. Uh, tiredness, sleepiness goes away. That's the effect of clock-dependent alerting. It doesn't go away. Uh, when I go to bed, my, someone talked to me before the lecture. Their mind races at bedtime. It's hard to fall asleep. That's because clock-dependent alerting is, is keeping your brain very active. And then the, the, weird, the one that I, the weirdest of all is students will say, I'm too tired to sleep. You know, they, well, no. If, what happens at 3 a.m.? Oh, well, then I fall right to sleep. Uh, I'm going to, why 20 minutes? I'm going to skip this. Although we did do a study years ago uh, when we didn't understand things too. We had 40 volunteers from Cedro House, and they went to bed at 10 a.m., and everybody had insomnia. Uh, to bed at midnight, to bed at 2 p.m. Now we're starting to, the later at night they go to bed, the more likely you are to fall asleep. At 4 a.m., nobody had insomnia. Uh, this is my class at Stanford, and I asked students if they felt drowsy in class, you know, the eyelids get heavy, to shout, drowsiness is red alert. They were too shy. So I said, if you feel drowsy, hold up a red card. Gave everybody a red card. I was kind of horrified. Uh, <laughs> we're all drowsy. Uh, so now this... When you pay off your sleep debt, as I've already shown, performance increases, alertness increases, and here's the class with when they've, if I exhort them to get all that extra sleep. Um, I'm going to kind of skip ahead because I'm running out of time. Uh, the common sleep disorders are obstructive sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, and various uh, kinds of insomnia. And, and if you take a large population, about 95% will have one of, one of those three disorders, or all three. And then other things like narcolepsy are uh, comparatively rare. Uh, what is this now? Oh, yeah. And this is uh, the throat of, of someone who snores. Snoring is the first sign of obstructive sleep apnea. Is, can you hear this? This is what your throat looks like with a fiber optic scope looking down. The tongue is at the bottom, the palate is at the top. Are, are there any married folks in here? <laughs> I mean, somebody's got to be sleeping with this noise every night. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well said. It's, you know, I like to say that the timber, the frequency, the tone is almost like a fingerprint. Oh, that's George. I can tell. The low rumble. Now that was an apnea. Apnea means no, no airflow. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll move on. Uh, a small airway is the risk factor for snoring and then for complete closure of the airway and the serious illness known as sleep apnea. This is the treatment of sleep apnea. It's called continuous positive airway pressure delivered through a mask that fits over the nose and it just maintains an air pressure that holds the airway open. Um, and notice, by the way, that it's two for the price of one. <laughs> but she's now sleeping very well. Now this, this um, the next, 
this is a couple, both of whom had sleep apnea. And typically, victims of this problem are often overweight. And this couple, uh, when we saw them in the clinic, they were overweight. And, and uh, they complained of snoring. And because you wake up to breathe hundreds of times, you're very, very tired. So they were treated. They actually sent me this Christmas card. But when they came for their follow-up visit, oh, and yes, I forgot that they, they had become, uh, they'd lost their libido because of the fatigue of this illness. So although we recommended weight loss, they didn't lose any weight during about three months of, being, of having this treatment, but they had a tremendous increase of, in alertness. And so they, when they came for their follow-up business, they said, you know, with these hoses on our noses, and we haven't lost any weight. We may look like elephants, but we're screwing like rabbits. <laughs> they actually said this. I'm not, I'm not making this up. I was shocked, I tell you. I immediately ordered them out of my office. <laughs> so tiredness and fatigue, that, that is always in young, healthy young adults, that's sleep debt and... Uh, this is what people say frequently. I found this, almost every law enforcement personnel have, I'm tired all the time and I don't know why. Well, because they're sleep deprived. They, they have weird hours. Uh, now, this was just a demonstration of the lack of education that, that we uh, do a questionnaire with the Stanford students and essentially no exposure in high school whatsoever. Uh, and this is the, you know, about 6% uh, have any exposure. So we have this reservoir. Of, we have an encyclopedia of knowledge about sleep, but it isn't flowing to the public. That's what this, this is intended to depict. I think that's a, probably a good place to stop. You now, hopefully, uh, I would be coming back a time or two, and I think that we would hope to have Google as a place we have great nutrition, great physical fitness, and wonderful, healthy sleep. So if you want to ask questions, I certainly can do that. I, I used to be a fan of Mary Tyler Moore. Most of you are too young to even remember. But she was, was very sick, and she... She had this old dress that had a tear in it or something, supposed to go through. But she just said, I usually look so much better than this. And I, I say, I usually perform a little better than I have performed today. <laughs> I don't know. Why did I feel I had to say that? I don't know. Uh, yes? Um, I have a question about the sleep paralysis. Uh, sleep paralysis. You, point, you pointed out that in. Uh, REM sleep, the body is paralyzed, and also when you is were talking... Is that microphone working? I'm... Yes, it is. Okay. okay. Uh, and, in, and also in narcolepsy, the body is paralyzed. Is it the same mechanism in the yes, brain? Yes, it is, it is the same mechanism. And, it, you know, we've shown that <clears throat> in experimental animals, the same cells in the brain are firing, uh, and there's no other ex possible explanation. It's, it, but it's a non-reciprocal... See, when I... Uh, you know, uh, tense my biceps, my triceps are inhibited, but that inhibition goes to every single muscle, and it happens all at once in cataplexy and in REM sleep. And so, so in REM, that permits you to dream, and your brain does all the things that you're doing in the dream, but your body doesn't move. Or, you know, if, there is an illness where that inhibition actually fails, and when these people go into REM sleep, they jump out of bed, they can run into the wall. It's a very serious illness. And it, you know, it, but it can be treated. Yes, sir. In terms of uh, the actual hours that we sleep, so are we at the mercy of the biological clock? If, if our, are you we at can't the mercy sleep? of the biological clock? If we can't sleep yes. until four, then we. Well, there's no. You need to learn when you're mo You know that <clears throat> when usually people can tell when clock dependent alerting is at its peak, and. You, you know, there's no point in trying to sleep. Usually you just lie in bed wide awake. And the typical story is that I've heard 
hundreds of times. My mind is racing and I can't fall asleep. Well, what happens at 4 p.m.? You fall asleep. But you can reset your clock. Bright light uh, late in the day will delay the clock. Bright light early in the morning will advance it. Thanks. Did I say that right? <laughs> um, so I know a person who wakes up repeatedly at night uh, to go to the restroom and then drinks water and then wakes up again um, to go to the restroom again. Um, now, I keep maintaining that this is a bad idea because, you know, you should get continuous sleep. Um, do you think REM sleep is affected by this, or what are your well, thoughts on this? Affected by drinking water? Well, and then waking up to go to the restroom, well, and then... Uh, yeah, but REM sleep, both non-REM sleep and REM sleep are homeostatic processes, and as they're, as they're reduced, the pressure, or you might say, the tendency to occur increases, gets more powerful. So it's harder and harder to totally eliminate either state. Uh, I think if, if someone does something habitually every night, it probably, you just haven't established an equilibrium and it's okay. But you know, you'd have to do, wake up, God, I don't know, a hundred times to really eliminate REM sleep significantly. Oh, okay, and, and the second question is really small, is uh, how bad are alarm clocks? Should we just throw them all away? How bad are alarm clocks? Yeah. Uh, if they don't go off and you're supposed to be at work, they're bad. Uh, <laughs> but lots of people use an alarm clock. And, it, and in fact, because we all are to some, have some sleep deprivation, most people can't wake up at, when they want to. I mean, a lot of people say, yeah, I set my mental, mental alarm clock. But, but if there's any danger of oversleeping, it's better to use an alarm clock. Now, when students uh, lower their sleep debt to getting closer to zero, then they waken spontaneously in the morning at a more or less proper time. But alarm clocks are not bad. Now, people have their own favorite alarm. You know, some of the people like music, some people like a loud noise, the typical ring, et cetera. And I think now the technology would allow you to do almost anything. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's a one person who said, he, this woman would come into his room and caress him awake. I said, well, that's a little expensive, isn't it? I <laughs> so uh, when I was younger, I could handle many cups of coffee a day and it didn't seem to have any problem. Now, pretty much I can't handle a full cup of, of regular coffee at all without it messing up getting to sleep that night. Talk to us about caffeine. Well, caffeine, <clears throat> first of all, it's the number, it is the number two most traded commodity on the planet and uh, widely, widely used. And most people get tolerant that, that if you, I'll never forget, I, as a sleep researcher, I drank a lot of coffee because I had to stay up at night. And I went on a vacation and didn't drink any coffee for about six weeks. And then when I came back, I didn't think about it. I started to drink the amount I was accustomed to. I about went through the roof. I was, uh, so that you, what happens is with age, you, you become less tolerant. And with use, you become tolerant. And that, there's no question it changes with age. Um, you know, caffeine is in a lot of things. And, and I think, I don't think you're compelled, you know, like the Coca-Cola doesn't say so much caffeine, I don't think. There are books that will tell you, but they don't have to put it on the bottle. Uh, what are your thoughts, knowledge, and advice about uh, the drowsiness that can happen after you eat a large meal? After a large meal? Yeah. Drowsiness after a large meal has nothing to do with the food. It, it is the stimulation of hunger is eliminated, and it allows your sleep debt to function more fully. Now, there's a lot of uh, mythology about what kinds of food make you sleepy, but when you test that, we have tested uh, that the food doesn't make you sleepy. So, so uh, we did one study where we had 40 different lunches. And the people would eat this, there's no lunch, lettuce only, mashed potatoes and gravy, spaghetti, you name it. And then we'd look at sleepiness after, during the afternoon, and there was no relation to the meal. So it's mainly time of day. Thank you. 
No, and when we lower the sleep debt, people stop getting sleepy after lunch, right? Can you say anything about polyphasic sleep, or either as the Uberman sleep schedule popular a couple years yeah. back among the technical community or another community? I don't. People are. I think it's terrible, frankly. I don't. I don't think anyone's ever successfully done it. Anyone's ever improved something with polyphasic sleep. I, and it's in, highly inefficient, you know, because let's say you got to sleep every four hours. It takes a certain amount of time to fall asleep. It's better to have that, waste that time only once a day than six times a day or something. Uh, but I don't know of a single monitored instance where it's, where it's made someone better in any way. <laughs> time to go to sleep. Um, I consider myself on the other side of this dam. If I don't have time to take your course at Stanford, where can I learn more about uh, how to we have sleep? A, there's a book called The Promise of Sleep. There are actually a lot of books on sleep now. Um, they aren't widely circulated. The Stanford Bookstore, you can, order, you can order my book, and it's a pretty good book, I would say, <laughs> The Promise of Sleep. It was kind of funny. I wanted to call it The Promise and the Peril of Sleep because sleep disorders can kill you. And I uh, had about a six-month argument with the publisher. Oh, that'll give it a negative. <laughs> anyway, uh, we're, gonna, we're thinking about a second edition, but don't wait for it. Uh, do you have an opinion about uh, young children and making them get out of bed early, or should they just be allowed to making sleep? Making them get out of bed early? Yeah, I'm aware get of Get out of bed, That's right. you. Well, you know, like uh, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., different kinds of programs I, I and very think, early. Is, uh, is that really good for them or not? Children tend to wake up spontaneously. I mean, if sort of left to their own devices, the main thing is in enforcing a bedtime because they don't want to go to bed. Even if there's, you know, there's, my, I can remember most recently my youngest grandson said, oh, I'm going to go, you better go to bed. No, no, I'm not, I don't want to go to bed. I'm not sleepy. Right. <laughs> right. So if you don't get them to bed, then... You know, they will lose sleep. So uh, sleep need decreases with age. And the, what I use as an anchor is at the age of 10, you need 10 hours of sleep. You know, and there, there are individual differences. And, you know, it kind of goes down slowly to eight hours or even less as you get older. And it's a little more. Like a six-year-old would need 12 hours probably. But they, you can tell when a child isn't getting enough sleep. They get irritable and cranky and... They start failing in school. And now mm -hmm. that, I used to think, I don't have data anymore, but it was a, a lot, one of the big reasons people got on to methamphetamine and, and amphetamine, because high school students are very sleep deprived. That's a rule. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. So did you do this? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I have to tell a story. This is a very raunchy story. I'm sorry. But uh, I was giving a talk to to Congress, and Congress is like 90% male. And so my, my Washington representative said, be sure when you talk about sleep apnea to mention that it causes impotence <coughs> in addition to sleepiness and heart disease and all the other bad things. Oh, maybe I better not. <laughs> they're, they're shaking their head. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, so my assistant is in the back of the audience, and I completely forgot to mention impotence. And you know, so he gives this signal, there's this signal, there's this signal, et cetera. Well, he was in the back doing this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm just kind of like, what is he, what? And I'm trying to talk, what? I finally got caught on. Uh, it was kind of funny. Well, that's not a very good note to end on. Uh, sleep is good. Get lots of it.